On September 22nd, 1904, the New York Giants won the first game of a doubleheader against the visiting Cincinnati Reds at the Polo Grounds, clinching the National League pennant. The rival American League remained locked in a tight battle. Four days later, with the public and press excited about the prospect of a postseason championship series, the Giants owner, John T. Brush, announced that his team would not face the American League champions. He issued the following statement. The National League is the premier organization in America. It is pregnant with grand achievements of the past in the realm of sports. It has elevated the game of baseball and given it such character and standing that its devotees may be counted by the million. There is nothing in the Constitution or playing rules of the National League which requires its victorious club to submit its championship honors to a contest with a victorious club of a minor league. We are content when our season is ended to rest upon our laurels and we'll be ready to defend our title in the contest of 1905 against the combined efforts of all the clubs represented in the grand old time-honored National League. The minor league Brush alluded to was none other than the American League. But just the previous year, the Boston Americans, today known as the Red Sox, had played a postseason series against the National League's pennant-winning Pittsburgh Pirates, defeating them in a best-of-nine contest. So why back out now? Many fans were convinced that Brush feared a similar embarrassment and they openly accused the Giants' owner of cowardice. One such fan declared, Brush's hidden slur placing the American League in the minor league class is so stupid it will not even deceive the bat boys at the polo grounds, to say nothing of any grown person that follows the game. The swift and forceful public backlash against Brush's refusal to play a postseason championship series was all the more surprising because it had been a long, hard battle to convince Americans that they could trust the results of such a series. Allow me to explain. Team sports had been uncommon in the United States prior to the mid-19th century. Sporting activities were mostly restricted to simple tests of prowess, and the public, expecting the strongest or fastest contestant to win every time, tended to be deeply suspicious of any surprising results. Sports writers were obliged to periodically remind their readers that in a team sport like baseball, it cannot be expected that a club can win every game. During the years of explosive economic growth after the Civil War, there was the additional issue that baseball games were contests between the members of rival social clubs which made it essential to keep competitiveness in check. So while a winner or loser had to be acknowledged, great care was taken to stress that the outcome was not the most important thing. One odd outcome by today's standards is that since the rules of baseball called for nine innings, nine full innings were played even if the club batting last was already ahead and assured a victory. At the conclusion of each game, both sides gave three cheers for one another and the umpire, after which the captain of the losing nine presented a trophy to the captain of the winners. And the trophy in question was none other than the game ball. When I say the game ball, I mean that at the time, just one ball was used per game. If it rolled off into a creek, you dried it off and played on. If the ball was hit into a seating area, the fans returned it. And if the ball appeared to be lost until 1886, the rules specified that the game stopped for five minutes to allow players on both sides to hunt for it. As a trophy, it was a humble keepsake to be sure, but ball players of the era meticulously cleaned these mementos, painted or gilded them, inscribed them with particulars about the game, and proudly showed them to visitors by mounting them in a case in their clubhouse. Remember, this was in the day when a clubhouse was not a locker room, but a building in which the club regularly met for various social activities. The extent of pride in these victories and their representative trophy balls became evident in 1908, 
when a Mississippi resident sent one such gilded ball from an 1865 game, which he believed to be the oldest baseball in the world, to Gary Herman, chairman of the National Commission that ruled Major League Baseball. But after a news item about the venerable object was published, a long series of claimants came forward from all over the country with other trophy balls from before the Civil War. For a while, it looked as though it would be impossible to beat a man from Emporia, Kansas, who produced a ball from a late season game in Boston in 1858. Then on January 21st, 1909, the New York Times broke the news that two quaint old leather covered globes from July and September of 1858 were in the possession of the son of a member of the celebrated old Knickerbocker Baseball Club of New York City. Years later, a descendant of that club member donated those very balls to the Hall of Fame. Remarkably, those gilded balls come from the very first series of games for which admission fees were charged. Over time, growing competitive fervor began to put a strain on baseball's high level of sportsmanship. After an 1860 championship match between two Brooklyn clubs ended in dispute, each side turned to the newspapers to claim that they cared not about the outcome of the game, but rather about the feelings of the women in the grandstand. The Excelsior Club of Brooklyn insisted that it was the duty of a club made up of gentlemen to leave the ball field when it would be impossible for their lady friends to remain with pleasure. The Excelsior's opponents, the Atlantics, responded by expressing doubt that women would want to attend baseball games if one side was liable to stomp off the field on all occasions when the pressure is rather high. In the years that followed, an increased emphasis on winning outstripped all attempts to devise a workable format for competition. A single game challenge system borrowed from boxing was used by many early clubs. But a number of significant disadvantages emerged. The one game format meant that only one side could enjoy home field advantage. So shrewd club captains began looking for other ways to gain an edge. The holder of a title might keep a strong challenger from getting a chance at dethroning the champion by accepting only the challenges of weaker opponents. In another example, a city club in Maine cunningly issued a challenge to play a rural club for the state championship on a date that coincided with a harvest. Such problems led many regions to switch to a best two out of three approach borrowed from horse racing. Unfortunately, this format gave the clubs a financial incentive to split the first two games, since by playing the maximum number of contests, they could maximize their revenue. It was that very situation in 1865 that resulted in the first acknowledged fixed baseball match, with one of the players agreeing to the conspiracy after a crooked teammate assured him that losing the game wouldn't hurt the club. As suspicion of the outcome became rampant, another term was borrowed from the world of horse racing, hippodroming which referred to any situation in which the paying public was presented with a supposed sporting competition that in fact had a predetermined outcome. Experiments were made with tournaments, but the number of games that had to be played made them ill-suited for baseball. Bad weather, travel problems, and no-shows also wreaked havoc. These problems reflected the larger issue that by the end of the 1860s, mounting competitiveness was having a corrosive effect on the rituals of earlier years. The early rules of the game referred to the baseball in the singular, but in 1877, the rules were altered such that all of the references were in the plural. As it became common to use more than one ball in a game, victorious clubs began to demand all of those baseballs. So many disputes took place that specific instructions eventually had to be issued for the responsibility of furnishing the balls. Clubs began to lose interest in playing the bottom of the ninth inning when the outcome had been determined, so that feature also was abandoned. 
All of these developments caused great dismay to those who had envisioned baseball becoming a gentleman's pastime. One writer reacted to the news of yet another championship baseball contest by exclaiming, have we not of late had something too much of these championship follies? As clubs began to care more about winning than about how they played the game, the spoils of victory also changed. Clubs in Connecticut competed for a miniature bat made from the state's historic charter oak tree. At a tournament in Boston, the entrance vied for a bat that was reputedly composed of pieces of wood from the John Hancock House on Benson Street, the Lincoln Cabin, the old Boston Elm, the apple tree under which General Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox, and the battleships Kearsarge in Alabama. A silver bat symbolized the national championship of Canada. Silver balls served to denote the U.S. national champion, top clubs in state competitions, as well as victors of local tournaments. Gold balls were offered for the champion club of Wisconsin and the victors at several regional competitions. And in 1866, the Hercules Baseball Club of Fulton, New York, won a silver ball beautifully inscribed with the names of each player on the club, including future Hall of Fame pitcher Candy Cummings. The advent of openly professional play in 1869 created still more problems. Even though the famous Cincinnati Red Stockings compiled an undefeated record that season, besting every top club, the various New York clubs took advantage of the challenge system to prevent the club from Ohio from ever playing for the national championship. The following season saw clubs from four different states have a legitimate claim to be the nation's best. Today, baseball fans would relish the excitement of such a situation. But in the absence of a fair method to determine the national champion, and with many Americans still skeptical of unexpected results, it mostly created wrangling. At the end of that 1870 season, it was said that it would take a Philadelphia lawyer to determine who was the true champion. North America's first professional sports league, the National Association of Professional Baseball Players, was formed in March of 1871, with entrance open to any club willing to pay a $10 fee. The National Association had no head officer and no paid administrators. So the money raised from the entrance fees was spent on the purchase of a pennant to be awarded to the champion. Unfortunately, an odd hybrid format was adopted for the inaugural season. Teams played a best of five series against each other, with the winner of the most series, not games, earning the right to fly the pennant. To distinguish a series from the many exhibition contests that the clubs also played against one another, such games were referred to as being part of a championship series. Nevertheless, the arrangement was the subject of widespread misunderstanding. And the best of five format had the predictable result of fueling rumors that the public was being duped into watching games whose outcomes were determined according to previous arrangement to secure the gate money. Tragedy added to the mix in early October of 1871. The Great Chicago Fire ravaged the city, leaving more than 100,000 residents homeless. Among the thousands of structures destroyed was the local ballpark. That forced the local team to play its final games on the road in motley uniforms. The pennant was awarded to Philadelphia, but more controversy ensued when instead of flying over the clubhouse, as expected by those who still thought of the social clubs as being at the heart of the baseball experience, the pennant was flown at a local saloon. The National Association's confusing most series one format was soon scrapped, but its use of a pennant to symbolize the championship became an enduring tradition that was continued when the National League debuted in 1876 and it continues to this day. Because the league was founded in the nation's centennial year, that initial pennant was red, white, and blue, and inscribed with the words, 
champion baseball club of the United States. And it was permitted to fly at the home grounds until the close of the following season. Other forms of recognition also flourished and proliferated. Players for the Providence Grays, including star and manager George Wright, received commemorative gold badges after capturing the 1879 National League pennant. And two years later, the league's pennant winners, the Chicago White Stockings, were presented with a vase made of parian, a type of china with an ivory tint. Champion clubs soon began to purchase their own custom-designed pennants. And great pride was taken in their elegant appearance and in associated ceremonies. In 1904, for example, the Boston Americans sent out opening day invitations requesting the honor of your presence at the raising of the pennants, celebrating the winning of the championship of the world and the championship of the American League. By then, the American public was beginning to accept that in contrast to the tests of prowess between individual competitors, in which it might be reasonable to expect the same result each time, team sports were unpredictable. Today, we use the term upset to describe a surprising result. But 19th century Americans instead referred to the glorious uncertainty of baseball. Bid McPhee, who played second base for Cincinnati, in a late 1800s career that carried him into the Hall of Fame, once said, baseball is a mighty uncertain game, as one can never tell what's going to happen. It is even more uncertain than a presidential election, and that's saying a good deal. Public recognition and acceptance brought much needed legitimacy to the idea of a season-long competition between the same teams. It did not, however, do the same for postseason series. After all, what is the point of a championship series in which the same teams compete once again? As a result, games played after the championship series ended were still regarded as mere exhibitions. However, the idea of a postseason championship became viable, at least in concept, when a second major league, the American Association, was formed in 1882. The National League champions from Chicago and their American Association counterparts from Cincinnati played a postseason series that fall. Still, nobody regarded the games as anything more than exhibitions, as was shown when Chicago fielded a lineup for the opener with pitcher Larry Corcoran playing shortstop in place of future Hall of Famer Mike Kelly. When Cincinnati won that game, Chicago presented a more normal lineup in winning the second game. But with a stage set for an exciting conclusion, the series was abandoned due to apparent scheduling conflicts. The two leagues resolved some of their differences before the 1883 season, but a significant talent difference remained. And a scheduled series between the two was quietly canceled after the American Association's standard bearer lost a series of postseason exhibition games against National League also Rams. Still, a glorious silk banner presented to the American Association champion, Philadelphia Athletics, though a bit worse for wear, survives to the present day. Note that while the Athletics won the 1883 pennant, the custom of the day was to refer to the club as champions for 1884, because they retained their title throughout the 1884 season. After that 1884 season, a three-game series was played between the National League champion Providence Grays and the American Association's pennant-winning New York Metropolitans. The nickname of the modern-day New York National League team, the Mets, is a nod to these Metropolitans. Because the regular season was known as the Championship Series, these games were billed for the first time as being for the world's championship. But they came nowhere near to living up to that billing. As National League partisans expected, Providence won the first two games handily to wrap up the series. Following gentlemanly custom, the third game was still expected to be played, but there was little interest in it. Eventually, Metropolitan's manager, Jim Mutry, offered to let Providence choose the umpire. The Grays manager cunningly selected New York's Tim Keefe for the role, 
thus ensuring the star pitcher couldn't participate in the game and Providence coasted to victory. Although the 1884 series had reinforced all of the reasons for regarding such games as exhibitions, a postseason series between the champions of the two major leagues became an annual fall tradition that continued through 1890. Importantly, the initial talent imbalance disappeared during those years, yielding tightly fought series and memorable moments that drew considerable attention from the press and public. Nevertheless, these games still had a hard time escaping the perception of being exhibitions. The format and number of contests were negotiated afresh each fall by the owners of that year's champion teams. And whether to play a predetermined number of games or a best of format was a particularly difficult decision. The predetermined number could render many games meaningless while a best of could lead to charges of hippodroming. That's because both sides stood to benefit financially by extending the series to the maximum number of games. In several years, neutral side games were included, creating an unfortunate resemblance to touring exhibits like the traveling circuses of Barnum and Bailey. That was especially the case in the 1887 series a 15-game whopper that was contested in nine different cities. A more fundamental problem was that there was no getting around the fact that a short postseason series undermined the message that an entire summer's worth of games was necessary to determine a champion. One of the most effective ways to increase public confidence in the outcome of a competition is to offer a valuable or coveted prize to the winners and several attempts to do so were made during these years. In 1887, the actress Helen Dovre, wife of New York Giants star shortstop John Ward, offered the first permanent trophy to the winners of the postseason series between the National League and American Association, the Solid Silver Dovre Cup. Dovre also presented each player on the championship club with an individual medal. The Dovre Cup attracted considerable attention, but it was retired after the 1893 season and today is nowhere to be found. Postseason matchups of the champions of the National League and American Association ended in 1891 when the two rival organizations merged into a single 12 team league, initially dubbed the Big League. That nickname helped to popularize the use of the phrase big leaguers to describe professional baseball players. The big league soon became known as the National League, and it initially borrowed a split season format that had previously worked well in a minor league. This approach gave each National League team a fresh start at midseason, but left the first half winner with no outward incentive during the second half. So accusations of hippodroming flew. Attendance also fell off dramatically in the second half of that season. The postseason, pitting the winners of each split season against each other, failed to attract much interest. And so the scheme was abandoned. Almost 90 years later, in 1981, in the wake of an eight-week player strike, the split season concept was tried again. Once again, it proved to be problematic. The Cincinnati Reds finished with the best record in Major League Baseball that year, but didn't make the playoffs because they won neither the first half nor the second half of the split season. Postseason series were revived in 1894 when Pittsburgh Pirates president William Chase Temple offered the ornate silver Temple Cup for the winner of a best of seven series to be played between the league's first and second place finishers. The 1894 contest pitted the first place Baltimore Orioles against the second place New York Giants. The event was enough of a sensation that lithographs based on a Henry Sandom painting of one of the games were sold to the public. But in four years of competition, the Temple Cup was not a success in any other regard. For one thing, each series was lopsided, with none requiring more than five games. In addition, the second place finisher took home the trophy in three of the four years. 
In practical terms, that meant that instead of determining the champion, as such a series should, it cast doubt upon the legitimacy of the season-long pennant race. Worse, many players undermined the integrity of the games by making side agreements to split their share of the winner-take-all pot with a member of the opposing team. Legendary manager John McGraw played in all four Temple Cup series as an infielder with the Orioles, and his first-hand knowledge of these many problems gave him reason to be skeptical of the whole concept. The Temple Cup was scrapped after the 1897 season. Though the format was revived for one last fling in 1900, when the Pittsburgh Chronicle Telegraph newspaper sponsored another postseason series between the National League's top two finishers, offering a magnificent $500 silver trophy to the winning club. After that, it was not until 1969, with the creation of Eastern and Western divisions in each league, that Major League Baseball's championship format again included rematches of in-season contestants. In the late 1890s, former Cincinnati sports writer Van Johnson transformed a minor association known as the Western League into the renamed American League of Professional Baseball Clubs. And in 1901, it proclaimed itself to be a major league. This made possible a new postseason series between champions that had not already faced each other. At first, the animosity between the two leagues was too intense to allow a showdown to take place. And Van Johnson's teams began to make signing raids on National League players. That meant war, and both sides knew that destroying the other league's competitive balance was the most effective method. In the middle of the 1902 season, John McGraw, then the manager of Baltimore's American League franchise, was convinced to jump from the new league to accept the same position with the National League New York Giants. And by taking numerous Baltimore players with him, he jeopardized the future of the so-called junior circuit. But some historians believe that the American League found an effective way to undermine the National League by deliberately raiding each one of its teams except for Pittsburgh, creating a competitive imbalance. Whether planned or not, that's exactly what happened. The Pirates won three straight National League pennants by comfortable margins, including a 27 and a half game blowout in 1902, and interest shifted to the American League. The rumors of sabotage created so much mistrust that even after a provisional peace agreement was reached in 1903, strict rules were created to restrict interleague trades so the teams in one league could not affect the other league's pennant race. As a result, it wasn't until the 1960s that significant trades between the two leagues began to take place. The 1903 peace agreement made possible the staging of a postseason series at last. This first modern World Series saw the Boston Americans upset the National League Pirates. According to Boston Globe sports writer Tim Murnane, a former major leaguer himself, many within baseball continued to perceive these events as being but exhibition games. A rash of injuries to the Pittsburgh pitching staff further undermined confidence that the series established a true champion. New York Giants owner John Brush expressed the preference of many National League owners in his statement in the fall of 1904 that ruled out the possibility of a postseason championship series. Conveniently naming all the National League cities, Brush said, the club that wins from the clubs that represent the cities of Boston, Brooklyn, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis is entitled to the honor of champions of the United States without being called upon to contend with or recognize clubs from minor league towns. Three years after Van Johnson's American League considered itself a major rival, Brush didn't. The Giants refused to face the American League champion after the 1904 season. But that winter, John Brush bowed to public opinion and drew up what was known as the Brush Rules. 
They laid the foundation for the World Series to become an annual event and an overwhelming success. Each fall in the years that followed, huge crowds gathered outside newspaper offices all over the country to watch giant scoreboards that were regularly updated via telegraph. Individual awards also became associated with the fall classic, but they weren't necessarily the rings that are awarded today. Under the brush rules, the winning players were to receive an appropriate memento in the form of a button. Eventually, these mementos gave way to the now familiar World Series rings, which today remain celebrated and tangible keepsakes for those lucky enough to earn one. Thanks to these developments, the World Series had made major strides toward becoming established as an American institution by the time its future was imperiled by the Black Sox scandal of 1919, a topic we discuss further in another class. Yet it is important to bear in mind that at that time, none of its traditions were more than 15 years old, while such basic ones as the number of games played were still in flux. Long-standing issues such as the tension between a season-long competition and a short postseason series continued to loom, while new ones kept emerging, including the annual threat of gamblers and the rivalry of city series, well-attended postseason exhibitions that pitted Chicago's Cubs against the White Sox, Philadelphia's Phillies against the Athletics, Boston's Braves against the Red Sox, etc. All of this meant that the fixing of the 1919 World Series could have easily led to the adoption of a very different method of crowning a baseball champion. But it didn't. Alright, we are back. Sorry about the little bit of a, a audio back feed there. I thought I had that set up and taken care of, but I forgot to uh, make a minor adjustment there. But other than that, everything should be good to go now for the rest of the show. Hopefully you enjoyed that uh, lecture number six, How Baseball Created the World Series. <laughs> Now on to our second part of our content for today. Uh, I am continuing with my uh, family mail call package from Left Behind Times. Unless the only reason it will be pre preempted as we continue to go through this box that Left Behind Times sent to me would be if I get another family mail call package that might preempt the scheduling of such said um, items. Let me just, uh, I got to plug my phone back in real quick. I had to make an adjustment here. <clears throat> but of course, the, the first, um, I still hear the video. Yeah, it should, it should be done now. I already turned off the sound in the background there. Um, you might hear the echo, 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 echo. Okay, I'm enough echoing. <laughs> but one thing I do have to do is the first in the live chat. The first in the live chat from earlier, so I do have to get these entries in there. So when I did go live, promptly at about 10.30, we had Kevin's Card Collecting came in with two chats real quick. Bibby Bobka came in with two. Cards in My Car with Ar Posada came in with two chats. And John Fishman came in with two chats. Um, should not have the, the little... Uh, uh, lecture audio anymore in the background should be all cleared up now we have seven people watching and seven thumbs up not too bad seven and seven but let me get uh the entries into the october drawing for the ones that were in the live chat first thing this morning 
So let me just get uh, everything in line here to get these entries in. So let me get Kevin's card collecting and more. His two entries. All right. Hopefully everybody is having a good day today. Sure hope so. All right. Next we've got Bibby Bobka. Bibby Bobka. All right. Then we got cards in my car with our Posada has two free entries. For first in the live chat this morning. Again, when I do go live, the first people that come in and chat do get their entries into the monthly giveaway. And then John Fishman. Let me get John's two free entries in here as our wheel of names is growing. Okay, I now have John's in here. Let me save the file. Uh, let's see. Dun, 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 dun. Lunch now. Cardinals fan must be on their lunch break. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I've got that taken care of right now. So I can get rid of that little note that I took at the beginning of the live stream. Let me put my pen away for now. And we will get into um, Left Behind Times uh, package that he did. Uh, I'm just going to get these stands lined up a little bit here for displaying cards that might come out from this package from the, the Mega Box from last week. The big... Uh, box that I got last week from um, Left Behind. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to see if I can open this up without uh, what, and, and save some blue tape on the, the side here. I always like blue tape to use for shipping my packages. That's for sure. So let me do a refresh on the chat here. Uh, eating pasta that's that's a cool nice easy lunch to uh, we do the same thing sometimes when we want an easy meal my wife will make uh, some pasta and then we'll just uh, eat pasta and it's nice to put like shredded cheese and Parmesan cheese on it and just pasta and cheese is an awesome inexpensive food combo that's for sure um, let me get some of this blue tape here, only because I think that's the way this package might be secured, but I don't know for sure. But we will continue going through the, the massive box that uh, Left Behind sent to me. I don't know for sure what's in this one, but it, it feels like it might be a, a, uh, a box... Um, I don't know, it might be, judging from the size, it could be a three or 400 count box, 350. Somewhere in that range is my guess. But of course, it's only a guess. There we go. Saved four more pieces of blue tape that can be used. Um, let's see. Let me get my trusty little knife out here. Cut off some, some tape here. Or at least break it loose and, uh, we will see what yeah it looks like it might be a count box I can see a little bit inside there up oh, it's another special Another special package put together by Left Behind Times. It's a 330 count storage box. Uh, the bag is empty. That's what was in there pretty much. Let me just <clears throat> throw this off. That's a definitely a reused and a repurposed package. That's for sure. Um, let's see here. I'm going to take off some more blue tape here. 
I like bigger pieces of blue tape. Oh. We'll take this bottom piece off here because it got stuck to some very loose paper. So that can go by the wayside. Let's see how this piece turns out. Uh, with chicken breast. Oh, there we go. Chicken breast in the pasta. That makes for a nice little combination. Add some some protein in there with some chicken along with the carbs with the pasta and that makes for a pretty good tasty lunch i am sure all right so let's see here oh my word let's see nothing here on here but what do we got here it says uh seattle mariners uh daryl johnson see little seattle emblem there seattle major league baseball so let's see what we've got here. Oh my word. This is a Mariners team box. Mostly commons. Seattle Mariners. 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. He has been looking for Seattle Mariners for a long time for me. Judging by the, the sight of this box here. We'll have to go through and highlight some of the Seattle Mariner cards that are in this box for sure. Let's see if I can get all the bubble wrap out of here. That was to protect it. Let me see if I can... Uh, let's see here. I'm going to take this piece out because there's definitely some... There we go. Now I can get the bubble, rest of the bubble wrap out of here. The bubble wrap pieces. You did a very good job here, Left Behind, packaging this up here. Going to toss that off to the side for now. And I guess we're going to... We won't take too much time on these, but I will go through these, that's for sure. I like me some Seattle Mariners at any time. Let me close the box up here for now. Put it back on the display portion back here. So we're going to go through and highlight through these Seattle Mariner cards. We got some old ones in here too. Richie Zisk. My oh. As one of our announcers would say for the Seattle Mariners. My oh my. This here looks like some 2019 cards here. 2019 cards but that's on the bottom i think they might be old to new so i'm going to put those on the bottom there see if we can go through and highlight some of these cards here some old cards the bellingham rainiers or the bellingham mariners jose tartable when he was in the minor leagues all right and then we've got here um Brad Road, pitcher, Northwest League Future Stars. Collect all 200 players. And a Fleer, uh, an Expos, Bill Verdun, manager for the Montreal Expos. Uh, let's look on the back here. But this must have been when he came to be with the Mariners but this is oh this is the Mariners checklist for the FLIR product that we just looked at here is this a FLIR no Pacific Sports Trading but it's a Mariners checklist a Mariners checklist <clears throat> looks like we'll probably have some some duplicates coming up here that's a duplicate Bellingham Mariners, 104, oh wait, 104, 108, almost a duplicate. I thought it was a duplicate, but it's not. It is different players here. So we've got a 104, 108, and 112. Oh, I see. This has the Expos checklist on the one side, the Mariners checklist on the other side. Cool cards there to add to my Mariner uh, items here. Let's see. We got 80, some 87. Yeah, I think these are in order from oldest to newest. So we'll just kind of go through and highlight some of this stuff. 
you don't have to say Seattle Mariners for each card for Left Behind. <laughs> we'll be here for an awful, awful long time. I'll, I'll, I'll do it this way. I am going to go through these cards fairly quickly, but we'll go through the years for the Seattle Mariners. But I won't do it each card since it's a Seattle Mariners box. Okay, so we did have some of the older ones here, the eight, 1984. And then these ones are, let's see if I can find a year. These are 19, so this is a 1984 checklist. Looks like my oldest one here for a FLIR product. And then we have the 1986 for these three here. I think it's going to uh, follow a little bit of a, a pattern here. Then, of course, we do have a 1986. Uh, tops baseball card the Mike Moore and then we have some it looks like some the 1987 Don Russ set here the 1987 Don Russ um, Lee Gutterman uh, Mike Moore uh, Pete Ladd uh, Pete Ladd again Alvin Davis uh, Bob Kearney Mike Moore Mickey Brantley, John Moses, Jim Presley, uh, Mark Langston, Mike Morgan, Carl Best, Mickey Brantley again, and Mike Brown. So some duplicates in there, but that is still cool there. All Seattle murders. I'm going to put these kind of up here for now as we go through and put them on stands. So let's see, next we have some 1988 Don Russ here. 1988 Don Russ, getting closer to Ken Griffey Jr. era. Uh, Scott Bankhead, Alvin Davis, Dave Hengel, Phil Bradley, John Moses, and Harold Reynolds. <clears throat> Again, for 1988 Don Russ. Some of the years that I didn't collect as much let's see here <clears throat> next it looks like we've got some 1980 uh... oh I see some of what he's done on some of these he put a lot of work into this box that's for sure um, but this is um, 1988 tops 1988 tops, a few 1988 tops here. Um, John Moses, Ed Nunez, and Mickey Brantley. All right, for a few more of uh, 1988 tops, right? You know what I just said? Yep, 1988 tops. So I do see a pattern here as we. <clears throat> go through the years. Uh, Bankhead's card looks like a double emblem. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, on this one here, that's because it's on the uniform, and that's the symbol they use, the same symbol they used for the cards. So, yeah, whenever I see those, it's always like, you think it's a misprint, but it's not. It's the logo from the uniform, and then the logo for the card for that year. But that is awesome. Um, looks like we have some um, 87 or 1988 FLIR here. I like that. It says uh, 1988 checklist FLIR. Um, he gave me this checklist because it has the Seattle Mariners checklist on here for the Seattle Mariners. And then if we go here to the... <clears throat> for the cards for 1988. <clears throat> I don't know how many of the cards I've got in here for the set but it is cool <clears throat> this is the checklist for the cards in this section for sure if i turn it over to the seattle mariners we'll see where we're at here 
there on the back you can see these these are the ones that are from the checklist here and uh, let's go through here go through these cards for um, 1988 flair we got Mario Diaz and Clay Parker uh, major league pros prospect cards there for them and then we got Dave Valley Dave Valley he is a, a an announcer for the baseball club still so still part of the Mariners organization Jim Presley Mike Moore Edwin Nunez Harold Reynolds um, Bill Wilkinson uh, Ken Phelps Donnell Nixon Scott Bankhead Mickey Brantley Lee Gutterman Dave Hengel Mike Morgan Jerry Reed, Mickey Brantley, Mark, Mark Langston. So there we have it from the 1988 Fleer product. Some of the baseball cards for that year. Okay. Probably going to run out of spots here, but we'll put these on the stands as I do have space. Here is a uh, 19. 89 Fleer product for Harold Reynolds. Harold Reynolds. And then it looks like we've got the uh, 1988, 1989 Donruss. The 1989 Donruss right in front of the Fleer. Then it looks like we've got some of the uh, uh, 1989 tops. 1989 tops of course ken griffey jr wasn't in this particular set because he didn't make it till the update but let me get all these 89 oh wow there's a bunch of 89 tops here so there's going to be lots of duplicates in here my word there we go all right for the 89 tops we'll see what Ball players we got in here. I'm sure there's no Ken Griffey Jr. in here because he wasn't in this in the base set here. <clears throat> so let's go. Greg Greg Briley. I don't have to say the team name because they're all Seattle Mariners. So Greg Briley, Mike Campbell, Jim Presley. We'll see duplicates for sure. Steve Trout, uh, Scott Bradley, Terry Taylor. Bruce Fields, Darnell Coles, Mario Diaz, Harold Reynolds, Scott Bankhead, Dave Hengel, Jim Presley, Mickey Brantley, Harold Reynolds, Scott Bankhead, Mike Campbell, Scott Bradley, Terry Taylor, Ray Quinones, Jim Snyder, manager for the Seattle Mariners back in 89, Scott Bankhead, Mickey Brantley again, Bruce Fields, Jerry Reed, Steve Trout. I wonder if he's related to the Trout family. <laughs> Mike Trout. <clears throat> Probably not. Let's see. When was he when was he born? Da, da, da. Usually they'll have their birthday night. No, it born 1957. He's a year older than me. I was born in 58. So it could be Mike Trout's dad or relative somewhere along the line. I don't know for sure. <clears throat> Scott Bankhead, Greg Briley, Mike Jackson, Ray Quinones, and Dave Valley, the announcer, one of the announcers for the Seattle Mariners. All right, let me put these here real quick. So more Mariners for my Mariners PC. All right. Here we go. We've got some 1990 Flair product here. A few cards. Henry Cotto, Brian Holman, Eric Hansen, and Harold Reynolds. So at least that's four different Seattle Mariners from the 1990 Flair product. Put that up here. Next we've got a 1990 Don Russ, Clint. Is that Zavaris? Yeah, Zavaris. Zavaris. All right, that's the, as Kevin calls that, the, that's one of the ketchup cards. All right, we go into this Bowman set here next. 
We've got, this is uh, 1991 Bowman, Henry Cotto, Dave Burba, another Dave Burba, Rich DeLucia, Roger Sel Selkhead, Alvin Davis, Patrick Lennon, and Eric Hansen. All right, looks like we got a rated rookie coming up here from Don Russ, 1991. All right, got some Don Russ 1991 products coming out next. We've got uh, Rich DeLucia, De rated rookie card, pitcher for the Seattle Mariners in 1991. Harold Reynolds, Harold Reynolds, Scott Bankhead, another Harold Reynolds, and a Pete O'Brien for 91 Don Russ. So again, this is a Seattle Mariners box. I'm just going through and for content on the channel, just going through and highlighting some of the cards I got in this box from him. 1992 Donruss, two cards, Jim Campinas, Mariners catcher, and Greg Briley, Mariners outfielder and second baseman. All right, next we've got some uh, 1993 Donruss coming up. Let's see, how many 93 Don Russes do we have here? A little bit of a handful here. Just a little bit of a handful. Probably be a bunch of duplicates in this one too. Oh my word, he did have to sneak in a Matt Noakes there. I don't know why he's, how did he sneak him? He had to, he had to jinx it and put a Matt Noakes a uh, Matt No how'd that Matt Noakes get in there? My word. I'm gonna find a home for that right now. Matt Noakes with the New York Yankees, 1993 Don Russ. I gotta find a home for that one right now. Okay, I found a home for that Matt Noakes in some other project I'm working on. Let's see if we have any more hidden Matt Noakes hiding out in the Mariners box here. He's not worthy of being part of my Seattle Mariners. Just kidding. Matt Noakes strikes again. <laughs> All right, so here we go. 1993 Don Russ. We got Jay Buhner there. Kevin Mitchell. Omar Vizquel. Tino Martinez when he was with the Seattle Mariners for a couple years. Lance Parrish. Rich DeLucia. Lance Parrish again, Brian Holman, Dave Fleming, Tim Leary, uh, Eric Hansen, Eric Hansen, Rich DeLucia, Tino Martinez, Eric Hansen, Sean Barton, Brian Holman, Danny Howitt. This makes up for the times when I get so many, when I'm pulling, I, pulling cards out of new baseball packs and I don't find any Seattle Mariners. This gives me a, a chance here to to see uh, my special box from Left Behind Times with mostly Ma all Mariners. We did find that Matt Noakes. I think he put that in there on purpose. <laughs> and Rich DeLucia. Okay, so let me um, here. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this real quick because I'm gonna get these ready to put back in the box. We got the 92s, we got the 91s. So we're going through the years here. Through the years here. And then back to 90, some 90 flares. And then we had the uh, 89s here. I'm gonna kind of put these back in reverse order so they're in year sequence. Of course, the 89 uh, Don Russ here. <clears throat> then we had the 80, 88, or uh, 89 flare, and then the uh, 1988 flares. <clears throat> Going back in time here, 88 tops, 80 or in, yep, uh, 88 Donruss, 87 Donruss. Then we had the, uh, this is the 86, right? And this should be, probably might be the design for the 2021 inserts if they keep following their series. And then of course the older 
Seattle Mariners right there. So I'm going to set these aside for the moment, get those back in reverse order again, put them back in the box here like I do. Um, and he did do put a disclaimer on there that these are mostly, it doesn't say all common, so I might find something good in here. But it, his little note does say mostly commons. So he did throw a disclaimer in this box. So he did put a disclaimer in this box, that's for sure. Here, I'm going to put it right here so you can see the, the top of the inside of the box. So let's go through some more of these cards. Oh, wow, we've got, oh, these are a lot more newer cards coming up starting here. Let's see, this one is um, 1995, um, 1995, some 1995 uh, cards here. 1995 tops, uh, Tim Davis. And then uh, Felix Furman, uh, Dan Wilson, he was a catcher for quite a few years for the Seattle Mariners, uh, Bobby Ayala, uh, Chris Bazio, forgot Chris Bazio played for the Mariners for a little while, Mike Blowers, Mike Blowers is another announcer for the Seattle Mariners, and uh, Max Suzuki, Max Suzuki, so these are all um, 95 tops. That was a rookie card from Max Suzuki there. I'll just put some of these in here unless we find some good hits that I want to separate out. But we will see. We will continue through this box here. Let me see. Looks like two cards next in the next series. This top set is, um, I believe, 1998. I got to break out my little magnifying gra glass here. 1997 tops. These are some two 1997 tops. We got a Joey Cora, a Joey Cora, and a prospects card for the Seattle Mariners is on the top there, and that's Gil Mesh. Gil Mesh, when he was with the Seattle Mariners for a short while. But nice cards right there, and I like this set here. This is one of the subsets from the top, Tops Archive, the 2002 Tops, the 2002 Tops. I do like this design, just the same like the Archive set they did for 2020. Um, but this is Aaron Seeley, Brett Boone, um, Al Martin, another Brett Boone. Got to put them together there. That should duplicates should be next to each other. Mike Cameron when he was with the Seattle Mariners, and another Aaron Seely. All right, so that again is 2002 tops. Let's see. Looks like we got a couple rookie cards in here coming up. This is starting when they kind of put the the rookie card emblem on the cards. All right, and these are. 2010 tops. You guys should recognize this set. This was from yesterday. We just did the 2010 set yesterday. So now I get to open and display the Seattle Mariners from that set. Um, Jose Lopez. Uh, Can Kanekoa Texera. Rookie card. Um, Ian Snell. Ian Snell. Uh, Michael Saunders. Um, Casey Ko Kochman, uh, David Ardsma, uh, Ryan Roland Smith. I remember reading that one out yesterday. And then we've got Jack Wilson, and we've got Doug Fister. So, Left Behind Times must have a lot of cards if he's if he can go through and find all these Seattle Mariners for me. Usually when I try and find good deals on eBay and stuff, um, I'll make some purchases and stuff. But now I got more Seattle Mariners that I didn't even have to add to my set. Um, but let's see here. Um, these look like... Um, oh, wait. These are... Yours are kind of 
kind of a little bit mixed up here. But let's see what we got here. These look like, oh, let's see, we got a Malik Smith mixed in. Here when I thought he was doing everything in order, now he's mixing the box up. But let's see, that one's this year. But these look like they are, let's see, 2017. Let's see, I'll say this is 2016, Carson Smith with the Seattle Mariners. 2016 card. And then this one, I believe, these two are 2017s. Yeah, these are both 2017 cards. The uh, first pitch, August 22nd, 2016, Morimoto, Safeco Field. I think that's when they get those different... Uh, star of the Japanese cooking show, Iron Chef. And it's spin-off, Iron Chef America. So Morimoto is the guy that started off the Iron Chef, but that was from Japan. And then it took off and they made the Iron Chef America which uh, I'm trying to remember the, the guy's name that does it on the U.S. side. Yep, go Seattle Mariners. And then Malik Smith um, with the Tampa Bay Rays. But, of course, everybody knows he did come to uh, Seattle and played with the Seattle Mariners also. So that's why I can see he, why he put the, the Tampa Bay Ray card in there. But Malik Smith did come and play for the Seattle Mariners. That's a first pitch card. I'll, I know where I, I, I have a home that that one will go to. <clears throat> and then it looks like we've got some, uh, oh, wait a minute, a little bit mixed up in here, but that's okay. I'll get these put into the right side. Actually, no. I won't. These will be, let's see, if I can find in some more 2016 cards and 17s. So it looks like now we're just kind of mixed up with some of the different cards here, but that is okay. It's still fun to go, go through this. Danny Valencia with the Seattle Mariners. What's he saying? Like, safe, safe. I like those. I don't know. I don't know for sure if these are short prints or what. Um, I don't think they would be necessarily short prints. But I could do some research and find out for sure, I suppose. But Robinson Cano, he's no longer with us. And Danny Valencia, though. So some newer cards intermixed in here now. Sorry, just trying to slide them into the box. Let's see, Marcos Gonzalez. This is a 2018 Tops, Mike Zanino. Mike Zanino is now on the Tampa, Tampa Bay Rays and made it to the World Series. Way to go there, Mike Z. Got to a team that took you to the World Series. And then we got Chase DeJong, Seattle Mariners rookie card, and Jared Dyson. Jared Dyson. Okay. This is a Series 2, an update series from 2017. Okay. Oh, the, the Matt Noakes for my, yeah, for my uh, collection there. Station identification break here for John Fishman with his $2 super chat for your Matt Noakes collection. I may get jinxed with Matt Noakes, but I do not collect Matt Noakes for sure. But I will find a home for Matt Noakes. All right, let me get John added into the giveaway here. Oh, really? Uh, Got to go all the way to the bottom real quick. Somehow my, my tab reset, so it was at the very top of the list, and my list is getting strong, that's for sure. Or not strong, getting along. <clears throat> Okay, got that saved. We are good to go here for our commercial break. <laughs> All right, so let's continue on here. 
going I'm, I'm going to save some of the the I'm saving some of these cards here for a reason down here. So this is a 2018 Ryan Healy with the Seattle Mariners. Ryan Healy 2018 card. So I am getting some newer cards interspersed in here. Felix Hernandez, Robinson Cano, uh, Nelson Cruz. He's in Minnesota now. Felix Hernandez is actually in Atlanta now. So we're getting into a mix of different cards, but still cool nonetheless. So put all these newer 2000 era cards in here. Here we go. We got Marco Gonzalez. Marco Gonzalez. Marco Gonzalez. All right. These are 2020 Paninis. Some of the new 2020 cards. But Marco Gonzalez is kind of like our... We're hoping he's our up, up and coming pitcher replacement for uh, Felix Hernandez. That's for sure. Let me put the 2020 cards up here real quick. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of do this for now since I'm getting a little mix here. So we got opening day Marco Gonzalez with the Seattle Mariners. Then we got a Malik Smith with the Seattle Mariners. Another Malik Smith. I know he got uh, I think he got traded away. J.P. Crawford. And uh, this is another Marco got Gonzalez. Same card as the opening day, but this is the series one card. For Marco Gonzalez, Omar Narvaez, Omar Narvaez, another Marco Gonzalez here, another Malik Smith here, and a JP Crawford, and an opening day Domingo Santana. So, opening day series one. Here's a Bowman first card for uh, Kyle Wilcox. Uh, 2015 first Bowman card for Kyle Wilcox. He'll go in the the 2000 stack up here. Um, here's a uh, Alex Jackson with the Seattle Mariners Bowman. This one is a another 2015 card. All right, and then we got looks like we got a mix coming up here, but this is a. a a Robinson Cano, Seattle Mariners second baseman, Stadium Club for 2015 for Robins, Robbie Cano. Robbie Cano. Robbie, we call them here. All right, now it looks like we're back into uh, mixing up the years a little bit here. We've got a, um, the K-Man, Eric Hansen, score 91. A Bowman MVP. Frank Bullock, Bullock. This is a 1991 Bowman. Then here, oh wow, that's a nice looking perspectives card. Robinson Cano. Uh, this is 2018, as far as I can tell. I think it's 2018. 14, 15. 2015, hold on a second, I gotta break out my eyes. 2016, a 2016 card. So that can go in the 2000s era here. These are some older cards. We got some Gypsy Queens here from a few years back, it looks like. Uh, 2018, uh, we got a Robinson Cano and a Mike Zanino. And a James Paxton. James Paxton, I believe he's in New York. Um, I want to say the Yankees, but it might be the Mets. But, yep, James Paxton. Miss him, the Canadian. 2,000 error cards there. We got a 1990 score. Some uh, Jeffrey Leonard, Gary Matthews, 91 Ultra Fleer, Eric Hansen. Prospect card for Clint Nagot. Clint Nagot from 2003 tops. I gotta check something real quick here. Yep. 
I'm going to find a home for that one. Set it off to the side here for now. Find a home for that one, that's for sure. Um, Eric Canson, 1990, upper deck. Let's see, I think that's his second year card. Second year card with the Mariners. Uh, Robinson Cano, again, 2018 tops, or Bowman. 2018 Bowman for the Robbie Cano there. Here we go, some... Uh, this is some newer, newer, uh, this is 2020 in it. Yep, 2020 products here. Let me get the, let's see, I'm going to do the top base cards here, right in back of Marco. And I'm going to put these 2020 Mariners right here. Shed Long, Shed Long, Tom Murphy, and Omar Narvaez for base cards for 2020 Tops Heritage. That's the New Year stuff. A 1990 Classic Baseball. Uh, Pete O'Brien. Like I, I remember Kevin seeing these before and saying how the, they'd have the signature block where you could have them sign on the back of the card. I think it's better when they sign on the front of the card so you can see it there. But I guess that top or, Don, or Classic Baseball at that time thought that's a good spot for them to put their signature on the back. Don't ask me why. Uh, 91 Upper Deck, Mike Gardier. Harold Venards with a Leaf, Leaf product. This is a 1991 Leaf. Greg Perkle, MLB debut, 8 1994. 1994, Top Stadium Club. Another Top Stadium Club here, Kevin Mitchell. Kevin Mitchell with the 1992 Stadium Club. Uh, another top stadium club, Mike Blowers. Again, he's an announcer for the Mariners. Still with the Seattle Mariner Club. 1994 Stadium Club. Another... Uh, this is Bobby Ayala. This is uh, 1994. This is... This is how some of the players might be dressing today, though, when they go out in town. Autograph on the front is better. Yes, it is. <laughs> but this could almost be a 2020 card, for sure, the way it's designed. There's another Mike Blowers and a Dan Wilson. All right, so these are definitely a mix of older cards mixed up in here with some newer cards. So at least the first part of the stream there was um, older stuff. There's the Mariners, Mark Langston. This is 1989 Upper Deck. Uh, another Mark Langston. Uh, Mark McLemore. Mark McLemore with the 2002 Tops. Yep, I'm going to find a home for that one too for now. I'll probably go through some of these. I might pull some of these out and use these for another project I'm working on. Some of them. Because I do have lots of these team sets. But still interesting. Nonetheless, another Mark McLemore here. With a uh, 1992. Okay. Uh, 1992 classic best, Manny Cervantes. That's a professional baseball when they're in the minor leagues. Um, All-star checklist for the Foxes. Interesting there. The Seattle Mariner uh, Farm League Club, I believe. Tino Martinez with the Mariners. Felix Hernandez with the Seattle Mariners 2018 tops. All right. Put some of these in the box now as we continue to progress through here. All right. Omar Vasquez. Oh, there we go. Uh, 2019 Mitch Hanniger. Optic. That's a nice card there. 
Edgar Martinez. There we go, my first Hall of Famer in the box, Edgar Martinez. Put that off to the side here. That goes in my Hall of Fame holdout. Mitch Hanniger. We got some Mitch Hanniger. Looks like he's got some, a, a few more of the some of the star players coming up now. Uh, Omar Vizquel, not as much maybe, but he still did do pretty good for a while. Mitch Hanniger here, 2019 Don Russ optic. Another, uh, let's see, a 2020 Don Russ. Put that back there with the 2020 Don Russes there. This optic is, yeah, these are 2019s last year. Tino Martinez, score 91. Another Tino Martinez. Looks like we're going on a Tino Martinez uh, stretch here. Omar Vescal. Yep, Robinson Cano. Jay Buhner, Gold Cup card. Oh, there we go, another. <clears throat> another. Let me put these in here real quick. Another Edgar Martinez for my Edgar Martinez holdout. All right. Um, oh, that's right. And then, of course, you say Kikuchi. You say Kikuchi. I say Kikuchi. 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 Seattle, Seattle Mariners team card. Um, rookie combos. Markel Parker and... David or Parker Markell and David McKay. Then we got Daniel Vogelback from the 2019 All Star Game. Pretty sad we didn't have an All Star Game this year. Uh, Braden Bishop rookie card. Um, Dylan Moore rookie card. Felix Hernandez not a rookie card but an awesome card of Felix. J P Crawford. Uh, James Paxton. Domingo Santana. These, it looks like they're a bunch of uh, 2019 tops here. Um, Brandon Brennan, rookie card. Edwin Diaz, when he was our ace saver uh, two years ago. Yep, this is from his 2008. This is last year's card, but he did go to the New York Mets, and I don't think they're as happy with him now think he had that stellar year and went for the money, jumped ship with S Seattle, and the rest is sometimes history. Marco Gonzalez with the Seattle Mariners, Omar Narvaez, Domingo Santana, Wade LeBlanc, Kyle Seeger still hanging tough as a tried and true Mariner, true to the blue. Kyle Seeger likes playing the game. He's not all about glory and fame. That's what's good about a faithful team member. Um, Mike Zanino, but I am happy for Mike Zanino. He made it to his first World Series. Edwin Diaz, Brandon Brennan, Matt Festa, Gene Segura, Ryan Healy, Robinson Cano, he has been playing ball. He was with the Yankees, with the Mariners. Uh, trying to remember where Robbie's at now. Can't remember if it's New York or another team. Uh, Alex Colome, uh, Christopher Negron. I think these are all 2019 cards coming up here. Uh, Mitch Hanniger, Edwin Diaz, Malik Smith, Felix Hernandez, Ryan Healy, Elias Ronias. Marcos Gonzalez, uh, uh, Sean Armstrong, Kyle Seeger, uh, Alex Colome again, Ro uh, Robinson Cano, D. Gordon, James Paxton, Wade LeBlanc, Gene Segura, Mike Zanino, and Sam Tuviala. All pitchers. So mostly, uh, let's see, we had a 2020 Don Russ, Yusei Kikuchi. With the Mitch Hanniger. Then these were all uh, 2019 cards here. Mostly commons. Rookie cards. Appreciate that. I think it was a little mix of Series 1. I think it's mostly Series 1 and Series 2. Series 1, Series 2, and Update. Series 1, Series 2, and Update. 
So that finishes off that box. That was an awesome box there left behind. Really do appreciate that. And then last off on the top here, I will finish with these 2020s, the 2020 Tops Her Heritage, the 2020 Donruss products, and the 2020 Series 1. I believe this is probably yeah opening day and mostly Series 1 in here. So awesome, awesome, awesome cards. I'll go through there. I might pick out some cards I want to do something else with. But other than that, that was pretty, pretty cool. So that finishes that box from Left Behind. Again, let me just, I'll just leave this set here for now. So you guys can see that box there. Let me see, I'll just stand it up like I did here. I don't know why I even set it away for now let me uh put this stand right there put these stands out of the way right now so you can see the box right there it is uh almost noon so this is my normal length for a normal stream um an hour and a half that was good content especially especially since yesterday was a unusual stream that's for sure just want to put some penny sleeves in some of these cards that I set off to the side here. Of course, my Edgar Martinez cards will go into my Hall of Fame Edgar Martinez sort process. Oh, along with that other one, too. Why didn't you put them all three together there, blonde doll? There we go. So some new Edgar Martinez cards for my Edgar Martiz Martinez uh, sort process. <coughs> Hmm. See, Shedlong, former Reds. Okay, Shedlong was with the Cincinnati Reds before. Yeah, I probably could have looked on the back of that card and shared that information. <clears throat> but let me get ready to do my signature sign-off here. This was fun today, hanging out with my friends in YouTube land, Cardinals fan 1990, uh, John Fishman, I believe it shows there's still four people watching. We probably do have a few people. Nine thummies up, thummies up, thummies up for me. Didn't quite get to 10 today, but that's okay. I think we had 14 or 15 yesterday. And yesterday was a, we had different people showing up later in the afternoon when the ones on the, on the, on the East Coast got off work and showed up. So other than that, I'm going to get ready to sign off here and say good day. Tomorrow we will have our Hall of Fame Friday. And then we will get into some of Left Behind's nice big mystery box of repacked products that he sent me. Uh, Shedlong player for the, uh, was a player for the Daytona Tor Tortugas. Okay, Shedlong came up through the farm system. Looks like Cardinals fan knows where Shedlong came from, came from also. So, cool. The Daytona Tortugas. That must be uh, professional baseball. That's pretty good. So, yeah. So, uh, thank you there, Left Behind. for. Uh, uh, he'll probably watch the video later. He's probably at work right now. Or might be in the background sorting cards like he always does when he watches my show but that's okay if not he will catch the replay for sure i am almost 100 percent positive there so it was nice going through that mariners team box 1980s 90s and the 2000 era really do appreciate you sending that to me there um so other than that I can't think of anything else to touch base with anybody on today. Um, we'll give you a heads up today in pre preparation for my next sale. My next sale will be the 31st of this month. And the reason I'm doing that is because if I wait to do it the first Saturday, that's going to be in November, the way into the first week. But I want to do it um, just this way for this month. 
to just kind of get things uh, a little bit back on track. But then my November say, or yeah, my November in in the month of November because of having two sales this month, I probably won't have a November sale because the 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 way the month ends in November. Um, and I will be on vacation, but we will see if we might do some type of special sale coming up in December, like a, like a Christmas clearance sale or something like that. I'm still working on something to do, uh, there, but most likely we will kind of play it by ear as we continue through. Yes, Halloween day, I'm going to have a sale. At least it'll be in the daytime. I know most of the people that go out uh, trick-or-treating, if they're going to have trick-or-treating in their neighborhoods, will be. And I'm going to label my sale on the 31st, my Fall Harvest Scary Sale. Because it's going to be scary prices, that's for sure. You'll say, Don's gone, gotten really scary. Yeah, it'll be time to party. We will party with a fall harvest scary sale left behind might like that one <laughs> he likes those if you got to watch left behind's channel his videos in his channel um you you get 10 percent off if you dress up oh we might do that but i don't how would i know if you're in your costume or not hey don hey everyone frank's card corners in the house how you doing there frank Thanks for popping into the stream just as I'm getting ready to close up shop. <clears throat> but let me turn the camera around. I can talk to you this way instead of staring at the cards and not, not the much going on there. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's some of the upcoming things I plan on doing. Um, I am working on some projects here with these little binders here. And I got another binder over there that I'm filling up with cards. But um, I will be doing a, uh, towards the end of my tops, complete tops baseball card sets, we'll be going through and highlighting um, uh, some of the, the bigger tops products for this year. It'll, it'll kind of end my series going through the tops baseball card sets because we are going to go all the way up to 2020. Okay, uh, next week will be 2011. And we'll progress through our, our set all the way up to the 2020 sets. Notice that I'm saying 2020 sets. So we will be having more than one um, more than more than one video to complete the series of my base uh, my tops baseball cards. That'll be uh, well over. Let's see. I think by the time we're done with that, I'll have to verify it. Um, I think we started the Tops video card series in 1950, in the 50s, so 70. I don't know if it's going to reach quite 70. It might be 75 sets of baseball by the time we're done. You should feature the 2030 cards too. Um, I think I already did a highlight on that one, but if not, yeah, I could add those 2030 preview cards in. Uh, to kind of finish off and do just a separate video with that short little set that they did for the 2030 previews. Thanks for tossing that out there, John. Helping me out with that, how to close out the, the Topps Baseball card series with the 2030 card uh, previews. That That's nice. Thanks for popping that into my head there. It's going to stay in the back now, and I'm going to add that in when I do my 2020 baseball card sets for sure. Um, but thanks. So other than that, um, unless there's something else you all would want to talk about in the chat, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But those are some of the things that I do have coming up. So again, remember Halloween on the 31st. I'll try and start mentioning that from now on every day I do my live streams. Uh, Tomorrow, on Saturday, of course, this Saturday, we're going to do the 1996 uh, Denny's Grand Slam Saturday. All right. Um, Frank, uh, who, Frank's saying, who do you think will win the World Series, Don? I was late to the stream. Not sure if you mentioned it. Well, a uh, matter of fact, I didn't yet. But yeah, looks like Los Angeles took game one. Tampa Bay took game two in good fashion there. I think they won three to nothing. 
and they end up three to nothing. They won that one from the Dodgers. So um, I'm kind of mixed and torn between both. I'd like to see either one. I'm glad they're they're both in the World Series instead of the Houston Astros. Um, it would have been nice to see the Atlanta Braves make it into the World Series, but that's okay. The Dodgers are uh, a pretty good team. I will say that. But Tampa Bay this year, I think, is underrated. I think they have a pretty good team this year. So it's just going to be, I predict, this will be, all right, everybody likes to make predictions and stuff, right? I'm thinking, <clears throat> just in the back of my head, because I think what they're doing is they're trying to, to make the baseball season last as long as they can. I predict the World Series is going to go seven games you're rooting for the Dodgers, but I think the Rays in six, pretty pretty close to what I'm thinking. Uh, uh, Cardinals fan, Tampa, six to four. Six to four. They're only playing seven games, right? Yeah, they're only playing seven games. So I'm predicting that Tampa Bay will win in game seven. I'm predicting a seven-game series. Uh, let's see, get it right here, Blomdahl. A seven-game series. <laughs> Got seven fingers up there. Can't count my thumbs. Thumbs aren't fingers, they're digits. Um, <laughs> but a seven-game World Series and Tampa Bay taking it in, in game seven. That's what I would like to see. And that'll put us finishing the World Series, I believe, in November for sure this year. I'm pretty sure it's going to be in November. They got five more games. Well, I don't know. They could finish up the end of the month. But I'm thinking they, they're giving them days off between. So they just had two games. I think they got a day off. Then they play three games. And then they have a day off. So um, good prediction. I hope it goes seven games and is close. Nothing like watching a game seven. That's right. That's right. I mean, I can't watch any of the games either. I don't have any any... I don't have cable anymore. I did away with cable and uh, DirecTV, but hopefully I can find it televised somewhere through the internet that I can watch the games. If anybody knows how else to watch the, 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 the World Series baseball games, that would be much appreciated if you can do it through the internet. Uh, winning score, Tampa Bay Rays 6-4. to four. Okay, in Game 7. That sounds like a winner there. Tampa Bay Rays 6-4 to four in Game 7. We'll go with that, Cardinals fan. But it'll be fun. That's for sure. So um, other than that, I can't really think of anything else to talk about. But yes, the World Series is exciting. I'm glad that Tampa made it in. Uh, between Los Angeles and Atlanta, I would have rather liked to have Atlanta have won. But since the Dodgers did win, they do have a pretty good team also. And uh, hopefully it can make up for uh, the Houston Astros fiasco, which we won't go into that at all anymore. Just wanted to, uh, I'm glad that Houston did not make it. Personal, personal thoughts on that one. But I'm glad it was the Tampa Bay Rays and the Los Angeles Dodgers. It would have been nice for it to be a, a East Coast World Series, a Southeast Coast World Series, for uh, Atlanta and Tampa Bay. That would have been a, an awesome series, I think. Uh, but other than that, yes, um, we're, we're having fun. Uh, we're enjoying doing what I do on my channel, even though I, I, I finally squeaked up to 1,130 subscribers. Uh, so I got 1.13 from my subscriber level. Um, uh, I was following a different channel, and she's like score, soared through the roof. She's only been on YouTube for uh, just a little over a year, and she's got over 12,500 12, subscribers. And I watched her channel grow from zero to a thousand in a month. So I knew she was probably ended, ending up going to be doing something better. And for any of those that might have caught, followed her a little bit when she first started her channel, I'm talking about Coffee and Jam with Chris. They used, she used to stop in my channel every once in a while to get some pointers and 
things like that but uh, she definitely found her niche and if you go to her channel you'll see what she's doing but that's just not bag my bag of rice <laughs> not no pun intended about Asians or anything my wife's a Filipino and so is this lady but she found her niche and I'm happy for her I'm glad to see her channel growing the way it is but I there you go Cardinals fan 1990 you have 207 subs but don't worry if you're if you're trying to climb up the ladder you have to do you I, I did it my first year I I got monetized in less than a year which trust me it was very very hard I was spending so much time on the internet uh, visiting people's channels jumping on board people's bus I probably got three or four thousand people I'm subscribed to but that's what it took to get to my thousand subscribers and I do give a lot of thanks to um, uh, Jab's family yeah you go on his channel you he he's what up to getting close to seven is he at like seventy thousand seventy five thousand subscribers but I mean that's because he's did a lot of grinding to get that far but of course Every some people that have been with them for a long time uh, know some of the backstory there too. Uh, that part's sad, but things happen. But don't let things get in the way of family life. That's for sure. That's why I have to watch how I limit my time and what I do in the channel, and limit it to just a certain portion of my day. A small portion of my day is given to my channel, and that's what I give to all my faithful subscribers that do visit me on a pretty much regular basis and I appreciate that so uh, you know I have 1,000 I have the 1,130 subscribers but do I see a thousand people in my stream no um, and just like the people that I'm subscribed to know that I won't be there all the time but I did support them and get on board their bus so uh, I do appreciate everything that takes place in the channel. I never envisioned myself being like somebody like Jabs, that's for sure. But uh, everybody does their own unique different content and mine revolves around the history of baseball and baseball card collecting. And that's why I do what I do in my channel. Everybody has their own little niche and window. So other than that, it's been fun to just kind of spend some time in here and chit chat a little bit. Got pretty close there. I'm up to nine thumbs up. So if somebody has snuck in here and didn't give me a thumbs up yet, make sure you do. Thummies up, thummies up, thummies up for me. That's uh, Coffee and Jam uh, with Chris's uh, famous saying. Thummies up, thummies up, thummies up for me. <laughs> And that's it's it's very important. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Um, so, but other than that, uh, I'm almost to an hour and forty five minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and get ready to do my signature sign off, like I always do, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up for today. I collect, I collecting all sports. You're collecting all sports cards out there, Cardinals fan. Um. I would do that, but I'm satisfied with baseball. Baseball's one sport is plenty to be involved with, but I do like and admire people that like to collect and to collect sports cards. I mean, I do have a few baseball cards in my collection, um, but most, I'd say probably 98% of my collecting evolves around baseball. I just love baseball. I played Little League when I was a little kid, and I have fell in love with the sport ever since then. And so that's why I do what I do. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready to sign off for today. Um, it was a blessing to have you all in the channel today, and I appreciate everybody that made an effort to be here with me in my live stream. But until tomorrow when we do our Hall of Fame Friday and get into some more of uh, Let Behind Times uh, box he sent me. NASCAR cards too. That There you go. See, there's different people that I'm subscribed to in the channels like uh, 
Uh, oh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the name of his channel, but he's a NASCAR fan. We got NASCAR 9012. Um, we've got uh, Kevin's Car Collecting. He does like NASCAR somewhat. He does his uh, remote control airplane flying. He does videos on that sometimes. Um, but yeah, everybody has their own little sports and their own little venue that they like. Um, collecting all types of cards is fun, but that can get kind of pricey the more you get into that. That's why I'm satisfied with baseball, but trying to get rid of all my excess stuff that I don't really want. That's why I'm slowly finding the stuff and the niche and the items and the ways of selling cards to make it unique and fun at the same time is just such a blessing such a blessing so i will be shouting out and highlighting my mystery packs um probably for my uh fall harvest scary sale i i will have some of my mystery bags on sale since it is a sale it's not just to sell some product but i'm gonna put a few products that i did produce just for my channel members my people that visit my youtube channel yeah danny and gray's cards and toys is a big NASCAR fan too. And I know he follows NASCAR. He goes to the races and everything. So he really is a big NASCAR fan. Thank you there, Cardinals fan. Danny and Grace, cards and toys. That's the one. So appreciate that. Appreciate everybody that's been here. I'm going to take have lunch at a normal time today. And then I do have to work on uh, some more baseball card products, getting some things ready for some upcoming uh events and things to do so without further ado i'm going to uh get ready to just go ahead and uh wrap things up for today and till tomorrow this has been donald blomdahl hall of fame veteran sports cards and collectibles show you my t-shirt real quick wearing a, a little emblem here that's on my baseball cap kind of match matches up it's a matching pair so uh some me going oh oh some of me going to the racetrack also oh sometimes you go to the racetrack for nascar do you cardinals fan that is cool so until tomorrow morning same bat time same bat channel at 10 30 a.m we will see you all tomorrow so take care lord bless you and have a wonderful wonderful day and hopefully i might see you around the channels you never know where i might show up all right take care Love you all. Have a great, wonderful, and blessed day. Bye for now.